Vertical Raise is the premier online donation platform, utilizing email, text messaging, and social media campaigns to exponentially increase the reach of your fundraiser. With detailed tracking and the complete personalization of every page, Vertical Raise provides an easy system that works. Our experienced representatives have made us the most effective fundraising platform available. We look forward to the opportunity in helping elevate your program to the next level and reaching your goals. Visit online or call today. This is a Queen Bee Radio High School Sports Presentation. Looking for a three-set sweep of Aquinas in this sectional final. And Laney Rundy, running jump serve coming up. And it'll be an ace! And the Cubans, for the first time since 2012, are headed back to the dance in Green Bay. Twenty-five, twenty-one. 25-21, 26-24, the Cubans sweep the Blue Golds, and Cuba City off to the rest center in Green Bay, coming up on Friday morning. Welcome to another edition of the Queen Bee Radio High School Sports Roundup, presented by Vertical Rays Milwaukee. The fall sports season is dwindling down, and we only have a few local teams left competing in their respective sports. We'll tell you about the Level 3 football playoffs we have coming up on Friday night. We also had a nice one-on-one -on -one with a great one interview with Lancaster Flying Arrows cross-country coach Taylor Reynolds. Uh, we'll have that on our show today as well. But we're going to lead off with high school volleyball because we have one local team competing at the state tournament. RJ Osterhaus is with me to talk about it. The Cuba City Cubans going to state in Division Three. We did also cover Barneveld and Southwestern in the sectional round in Division Four. Barneveld beat uh, Southwestern in the sectional semifinal, but Barneveld did fall to uh, Fall River three sets to one in the sectional final in Johnson Creek on a Saturday night. But the Cuba City Cubans were able to advance. They got past Mineral Point, uh, the team that they had lost to uh, in the Swallow regular season that cost Cuba City a chance to uh, win the uh, conference title, avenge that loss, and then defeated Lacrosse Aquinas. Uh, RJ, you were on the call for both of those matches for the Cuba City Cubans. And, um, you know, really, Cuba City's looked impressive during this uh, postseason run. You've uh, gotten to see them uh, through the regional round as well as the, the sectionals. Uh, the sectional round, though, uh, seemed to be pretty impressive. One, avenging that loss. And then, two, making a very big statement against a really good lacrosse Aquinas team. Well, we, we talked last week a little bit about how they really hadn't been challenged in the postseason um, with all due respect to their opponents in the regional round. But uh, Mineral Point, you knew they were going to be. Uh, they were down double digits. I think it was 15-4. And they came all the way back to win that one 26-24 before uh, taking the final one. That was sets three and set four, I believe. But, boy, Cuba City, uh, man, they uh, – you wondered and talked to Kerry Lawson about it. I said, boy, when you see a team, it's going to be a turning point because you expend that much energy coming back. Are you out of gas or do you keep the momentum? They kept the momentum and moved on over Mineral Point. And then Aquinas, uh, it was a little more, I mean, it was it was a battle, but it's one of those where Cuba City, and, and by a, not a large margin, but they outplayed them three straight sets. They took care of their business. Uh, I thought it was a solid match for Cuba City. Maybe not spectacular. I think they played better than that. Um, but they got the job done. Um, they are in a loaded state field. This group of young ladies, though, they are forever those girls. Mm -hmm. Those girls who went to state. And uh, they've got the opportunity in front of them coming up on Friday morning. And I'm looking forward to it. It's a loaded state field. I said they're lined up uh, to face in the first round. It'll be St. Croix Falls. They are the top-ranked team in the state. However, the two seed uh, at state, they have two losses all year. One of them was to McDonald Central, who they beat in the sectional final to get here. The other one was to Rice Lake, who is competing at state in the session after them in Division Two. And this is the third time at state for St. Croix Falls. 
They uh, were there in 2020 as a Division II team, so they're kind of borderline enrollment or, or have been over the past three or four seasons here. And then last year they fell to Howard's Grove, who is the number one seed uh, at State this year. Uh, in the championship game last year, they fell to Howard's Grove. Howard's Grove, by the way, other side, the one hosting the four or playing the four in St. Mary's Central on the opposite mat. They played the semifinals in two mats at once. So there's going to this going to be dripping with talent, oozing with talent on the court, on the mats uh, coming up. The courts, I should say, they're on the courts uh, coming up uh, on Friday and just looking forward to it. Checking out the roster from a year ago for St. Croix Falls. A lot of these young ladies have unfinished business uh, and just looking Stand out is uh, a senior, Kelsey Cooper, 5.6 kills a set. The other outside hitter and middle hitter, which is her description, uh, Lucy Belial, she's got 3.3 kills per set. So those are the top two, a very big front row for them. And uh, setting them up, how about nine assists per set for Katherine Williams? She's just a freshman, though. She's new to the party. So, <laughs> But, uh, again, this Cuba City team has earned their way here. They are the best in the sectional. And, hey, it's there forever, those girls. And they have the opportunity in front of them. All you have to be is better on one morning. Yep, exactly. And that's a big matchup coming up uh, Friday morning. And uh, if St. Croix Falls is a familiar name, also remember that that is the school that the Cuba City Cubans baseball team beat to win the Division Three. Uh, state championship in baseball a couple seasons ago. So that's where uh, that uh, name may uh, sound a bit familiar to Cuban fans. But, um, you know, in in talking about leading into the sectionals, you had mentioned, you know, with Cuba City, how would they handle adversity when they would meet it in uh, the sectional round? They weren't really that challenge all that much uh, through the sectional round or through the regional round, I should say. Uh, but when they would face Mineral Point, you had mentioned that they were down big in that uh, in that one set, and they were able to uh, rally back. What were some of the things that kind of stood out in particular with the match against uh, Mineral Point, where Mineral Point's had Cuba City's number, you know, the last few meetings that uh, those teams have had. What, from your vantage point, what were the things that kind of stood out in Cuba City's performance in that match that led them uh, to compete for the sectional final against Aquinas on Saturday? It, it's the grind. It's, it's the don't quit. And you get to this level, everybody's good. And Cuba City was not intimidated by that. They did not seem to care what happened previously in the year. Uh, obviously, these teams are familiar with each other. But it was just, it's something about them is just so solid and so consistent. And that's what you love about this Cuba City team. I, I've covered, you know, a lot of teams over the last, you know, 25 years or so of covering volleyball on the radio. And you see teams just explosive power and it's like oh you got to look out for this young lady or that young lady and cuba city is so much as some of their parts they're so good because they're so good together mm -hmm. yeah it, it, it's a solid team all around there's not really one star player or, or anything like that it's everyone kind of does their part it's it's a well-oiled machine so to speak uh with them just from the the bits and pieces that um, I've gotten to see, and um, I, I think what's uh, kind of cool about this uh, Cubans team, too, is that they get the three seed. Um, you know, there might have been thoughts that they might get the four, but they are awarded the three seed. So, um, you know, a pretty realistic shot, you know, as far as um, the way that the seedings go. But uh, you had a chance to, uh, you know, talk with some of the girls and uh, talk with uh, Carrie Lawson after uh, the sectional uh, championship. I'm sure that's, you know, everyone was pretty chipper coming off the off the court, off the off the win. What do you think that uh, Coach Lawson and these girls are emphasizing heading into the state tournament coming up on Friday morning? It, it's got to be play their game. I'm sure they have a game plan which might be focused a bit on, on neutralizing those bigs. And Cuba City has the blockers up front to be able to do that, I think. But it's going to be play their game and, and also enjoy the moment. And I, it's I, talking to Carrie in the pregame, so I'm being so happy for those girls. And when they clinched it, I look, look down and, and you look at Carrie Lawson's face and you could just see how happy she was for them to be able to do that. And the 12th Cuba City team ever to do it, but the first since 2012 to get there. Uh, and, and, you know, you, you wonder as a coach, all the success you've had as a program, are we going to be able to do it again? And this team, I don't know if anybody looked at them when the season started and said, oh, this is this is a team kit. We're going to state. Well, you know what? It didn't matter what anybody thought because <laughs> here they are. This is, they are those girls, this is what they've done, and here they are. 
Yep, and, and this particular group of girls for Cuba City, too. Also, if you look at how many of these girls also played basketball that went to the sectional round last year, the softball, softball. team that competed for yes. sectional. Yes, there's there's a lot of... The, these girls have been familiar with uh, with some high stakes uh, events and, and you know, for, for these girls to uh, go to state uh, in volleyball to, you know, begin this 2023-2024 uh, school year, you know, definitely a huge accomplishment and something that can catapult them for success in those other sports coming up uh, this school year as well. Well, and that sets you up for this. You don't want to be the team that got there and fell just shy every time, but I think eventually... You can go one of two ways. It's, oh, no, here it comes again. We've made it to this mm -hmm. level. Are we going to be a bat past it, too? I think sometimes they, these these girls are so well coached across their sports, too, that it's, you know what? It's, it's This is another opportunity. We're, we're used to this. We belong here because we're here in every sport in a sectional final. And it's a matter of just getting through. Again, just like any, you've you got to be better than the other team for one night, regardless of what you're up against. They can have a lot going on. You never know what's going on. Everybody puts their their uh, spandex on one leg at a time. So right. go out there and battle. And, and it is, these ladies have the opportunity. Yep, and the Cubans will be in action on Friday morning. We'll have the match on Super Hits 106. Rally Cheese pre-match coverage set for just after 11 o'clock. The first serve around 1130, or depending on how soon the Division Four. Uh, matches uh, wrap up. That'll be from the Rush Center. RJ Osterhaus will have the call of that. And of course, if Cuba City does make it to the state championship, we will have that match on Saturday as well on Super Hits 106. Also, same uh, coverage time, 11 o'clock uh, pre-match and 11.30 for serve. Looking forward to seeing how it all shakes out for this uh, Cuba City Cubans volleyball team. It's been a fun journey uh, seeing them uh, compete so far this postseason. Thanks, RJ, for taking some time to chat about them. And coming up next, we will have our one-on-one -on -one with a great one interview with head coach Taylor Reynolds of the Lancaster Flying Arrows cross-country team. We'll also get you the level three football preview that we have coming up. Two big matchups on Friday night across our Queen Bee Radio family of stations and on the Queen Bee Radio Sports YouTube channel. We'll tell you all about it coming up in a little bit. Our High School Sports Roundup continues after this on YouTube and SoundCloud. Grow your business by enhancing your digital marketing efforts with Queen Bee Radio and Phase 3 Digital. We provide customized solutions based on your business's unique needs, including targeted advertising, website development, and search engine optimization. Contact us at 608-349-2000 or visit p3da.com slash Platteville to learn more. This one-on-one -on -one with a great one interview is presented by People State Bank. Looking for a checking account with no monthly requirements or service charge? People's State Bank's People's Checking Account is just what you're looking for. This account includes free debit card, online and mobile banking, bill pay, and much more at no cost to you. You heard that right. No cost to you. We're your local community bank ready to serve you. People's State Bank. Member FDIC. Welcome back to the Queen Bee Radio High School Sports Roundup presented by Vertical Rays Milwaukee. It's now time for us to go one-on-one -on -one with a great one presented by People State Bank. And our guests just coached the Lancaster Girls Cross Country Team to their third state championship in program history this past Saturday. We're pleased to be joined by Taylor Reynolds. Coach, thanks for joining us. How are you? Good, Tyler. Thanks for having me. I really appreciate being here. Yep, absolutely. I'll start off with a really easy question uh, uh, to begin. How awesome has it been being the head coach of this Flying Arrows team the past few days? And really, how awesome has it been for the duration of this season? Yeah, well, this is my 15th year as the head coach, and I've absolutely loved every every minute of it. It's just um, when you coach cross country, you're dealing with um, highly motivated student athletes. Um, they have good work ethics. Um, they have good attitudes. You don't sign up for this sport unless you have those characteristics. So it's been a joy from when I started and we were not super competitive to building the program um, to win a third state championship. We're just on cloud nine. It just, uh, just the, the smiles don't stop. It's been just super, super fun, especially these last few days. So absolute joy. Yeah, I would imagine. And it's been an incredible run pun intended, for the girls' team over the, the last almost uh, decade. Uh, seven straight appearances at state, eight appearances in the last nine years. From your viewpoint, what's made this program so successful during that time? Uh, yeah, I've got, I've got asked that question um, a few times, you know, like in different ways. What's the secret sauce? What's the secret recipe? You know, 
um, you know, part of it is just we've over this stretch, we've had talented athletes, we've had tough athletes come through the program, but I think most importantly, we've had dedicated athletes who are willing to put in the time starting in, um, you know, early summer and on the hot days in, in August and July, and they're willing to put in those miles to set them up for when the season starts and then they get after it all season long. And then, and then they can, they can finish the way they did here in late October when, it, when it's a lot colder and you forgot about you know, the hundred degrees days. In the summer. <laughs> um, so their, their dedication. Um, and then it seemed like once we got the ball rolling and they, and they kind of figure out, Hey, if we do this, you know, X, Y, and Z, then you put yourself in a good position to compete at the highest level. And over, I think the reason we've gone seven years in a row is uh, we've had leaders uh, sh show the example and, and and set the tone of this is what it takes. And then you have freshmen and underclassmen coming in and joining the team each year and they see how it's done. And I, I just stole the term from a coaching book, like shadowing excellence. So they just see it done at excellent level. So they just, that's all they know. They just do it. And then when they're leaders, they're setting the example and the next crop is coming in and they're shadowing excellence. So it's kind of snowballed over the last like seven, eight years in a really, really positive way. And it's been one heck of a ride. And uh, yeah, we just don't want it to stop. It's been really, really fun. I'm super proud of all our guys and girls for putting in all this hard work. Yeah, I believe it. Let's talk about your uh, coaching journey for a bit. Uh, where did your interest in cross country and distance running come from? What got you into coaching and what's kept you coaching all these years? Yeah, so if, it's a funny story because if you go back to middle school, I was going to be a football, basketball, baseball athlete only. And I was nagged by my best friend, uh, Casey Updike um, from basketball, where I'm a basketball alumni, um, to just try eighth grade track. And I tried it and the training and the competing and the racing, um, I loved it. I was successful at it. And then there was no turning back. So I joined the cross country and track team um, in high school. Um, I was really, really fortunate to, uh, get to run for a legendary high school coach and um, he's passed away. So the late Greg Bell, who's a hall of fame mm -hmm. um, cross country coach, biggest takeaway from him was he was really, really good at inspiring, motivating, being tough, but also kind, caring, loving, approachable. I think he had those characteristics and I hope to, you know, take what I've learned from coach Bell and, and apply a lot of that to my, to my coaching. Um, and then I was going to call it quits. Um, as a high school athlete, um, my junior and senior year of high school, we actually were the state runners up as a team. And it felt like there was just left a bad taste in my mouth. And there was unfinished business. Um, I took a semester off in college, but then ended up running um, like seven seasons between track and cross country for UW Platteville. And what I really appreciate with my time as a UW Platteville um, track and cross country athlete, I got to run for coach Tom Anzac. And in my mind, I always tell people he's the exercise science guru, had at one point more All-Americans than, than any other uh, coach in any division for, a, for like a, a period of time there. Um, so I use a lot of his training principles rooted in exercise science and his system, and, and it really, really works. And, and I and, and the team, we have a lot of confidence in our, in our training system as well. So that was kind of... Uh, my my journey as a as an athlete so then i got hired at lancaster as a phi ed teacher and i taught middle school health and phi ed for 10 years now i'm actually the middle school principal um but um my second year here i was there was a there was a vacancy for the high school cross country position and this the first season was the, the fall of 2009 and i took it and i've been at it ever since yeah, it's really cool. And, and you know, just hearing, you know, the, the two coaches that you had, you know, Coach Bell and Coach Ansack, like those are probably two of the most respected names, especially in Southwest Wisconsin from a uh, cross country standpoint. When you when you think back to, you know, maybe some of the advice or things that you've taken from them, what are some of the things that kind of stand out that um, either advice that they were given or things that you've kind of taken on as your own that kind of correlates to uh, your own uh, coaching journey? Yeah, oh, that's a good question. I and mean, I've never been asked that one before. Uh, I don't know if I have like uh, the specifics uh, um, and I'm kind of will kind of echo what I just said is I just I don't have like a specific story or an example I, I can think of off the top of my head. Um, but just knowing like um, Coach Greg Bell's um, just his motivation, his toughness, his um, ability to inspire belief 
um, in athletes and, hey, we can do this. Hey, we're the toughest. We're going to be the best. If we work hard, we'll do this. Um, he was kind of like tough and in some ways intimidating. And in some ways, uh, a teddy bear, you know, you, you can just jump on and <laughs> uh, you know be wrestling but at the end of practice too. So I think that was the biggest takeaway from Coach Bell. And then um, Coach Anzac, I just appreciate everything he taught me. I, I always tell people, I went in um, to college thinking I knew a lot about distance running. I knew a lot about training. I came from a good program. And I said, I, th I thought I knew this much. Uh, and Coach Anzac taught me, you know, can't even fit a, a screen <laughs> this much. And then I realized there's this much I still don't know. And I still don't know that stuff. So it's kind of like the more you, the more you learn, the more you realize there's, there's a lot more to it. So yeah, they were excellent coaches and, they the things that they taught me are a big part of our our program and our success and, and my ability to coach effectively awesome and i know that you know in addition to cross country you coach uh, track and field distance running there which is a pretty common thing that we see cross country coaches yeah. do uh, but having uh, been a distance runner myself, I know that there's a very distinct difference between cross country and and track and field. And with that in mind, what are some of the differences in the coaching methods that you have to use between coaching cross country and track? It, they're two different animals. There's, you know, you're you're looking at I'm <clears throat> in track and I coach the the half milers and the 800 milers, two milers. So there's just a difference there. And then. Um, you know, even in practice um, with the throwers and there's just so many more moving parts to track and field. Um, it's just a different beast. And it's in it and they're both are, are really, really fun in their own way, but they're just different. So yeah, in, in, in track there's a lot more moving parts. One of the things I kind of appreciate about cross country is it's everyone together, same mm -hmm. workouts, doing the same thing, doing the same race. Um, and not that we're not tight knit at track and field. I'm not saying that at all because we have a very, very tight knit, really right. um, successful track team. And they were the state runners up last year in the 2022, um, sorry, the 2023 um, track and field uh, state championships. Our girls were, um, and it was just incredible. And we had great, we had great uh, individual events, and we had great relays, and we had tons of medals. So it's just awesome. But yeah, cross country is a little simpler in the fact that. Um, everyone's doing the same things pretty much at all times. And I think you really, really maximize the sense of like family, camaraderie, togetherness, because you're you're doing everything together and everyone's kind of rooting for each other too. So yeah, both are both are awesome. I love coaching both. Um, but they are, yeah, there are different animals for sure. Yeah, but before we uh, close up, I wanted to ask you about uh, Mallory Olmstead uh, specifically. You know, she got to bookend her career um, with a state championship, um, you know, this year as well as the uh, state championship uh, one in 2020 a as a freshman. Talk about how special she has been and, and really, you know, just from, you know, what I've read and, you know, kind of kept tabs on throughout the season. It really seems like she's kind of been the catalyst and the leader um, of this uh, Flying Arrows uh, girls team. Talk about uh, what she's meant and and how much that success that she's had translates to the rest of the team. Yeah, Mall Mallory came in as a freshman and was super motivated and dedicated even at that point and has just continued to build her leadership. And she's met everything um, to the last four years of this program. She's been um, she's been dedicated. She's been tough. She's been a, le a vocal leader. She's been a leader by example. Um, I'm just so thrilled and so proud that she could go out on top when she, she was our number one runner uh, as a freshman all, all the way through, and that was the COVID year where we had subsectionals mm -hmm. and, and then sectionals. And she actually sustained a hip injury um, right after the subsectional. She, she ran really, really fast. She won her heat of it. And then at the sectional meet, um, she was in a lot of pain. She ran and she was actually not the first time ever, not our number one runner. And then at the state meet, we gave her a full week's rest and even, didn't even run her from sectionals to state. So the next time she ran after the sectional cooldown was the state warm-up. Um, and she was in an incredibly amount of, incredible amount of pain. It ended up being our fifth runner that day, but got it done so that she could, even though she was our fifth runner, she ran so incredibly tough to go through all that pain for us to win the title in 2020. And then I never mentioned it a lot to her, but in my head, I always said, like, I just don't want her freshman year to be um the one highlight of her career i want right. her to like mm -hmm. so um 
to see her be able to lead a group of girls as our senior captain. Um, I remember just, uh, I was jogging away from our starting box, box 22. I could hear her saying like two or three times as she was slapping hands, we got this girls. You're going to rock it. You're going to kick butt. We got this. We got this. And just reassuring them was get out there and, and do our thing. And um, even right to the minute the gun went off, she was reassuring them and, and leading them. So it was really, really awesome. She also facilitates, you know, like um, after practice activities and let's go out to eat and let's come over here to our basement and stuff. So she's, she's meant everything to our program over the last four years. So she'll be greatly missed. So. Yep, absolutely. And then, you know, now that the now that the season's done, what's uh, what's next for Coach Reynolds? What's going on during the the winter months before the uh, track season picks up? Oh, so right now, I got a just a huge to do list with uniform turn ins and extra <laughs> painter gears, and getting slideshows and videos, and it's just, it's a little overwhelming, but uh, it's a, it's a lot of fun to put it all together and then and have all those all those memories. And then we'll give all of our athletes some physical and mental break here for a while. Some will start their, their winter sports and wish them the best of luck. And then um, um, some of them will continue to train off, on and off. But once we get uh, passing into the new year, past the uh, winter break and in the new year, we will ramp up um, kind of our winter winter workouts as we, as we are uh, heading closer and closer to that March deadline when track will start so that we can hit our full steam ahead and, and, uh, hopefully uh kick some butt and bring home some medals in uh in track as well yeah absolutely well thanks a lot for joining us coach we appreciate the time congratulations again on the title i uh, give our best to uh, uh all the girls the coaching staff everyone uh on the team that uh, made the team so successful uh best of luck uh going forward and into uh the track and field season next spring yeah thanks a ton i appreciate you reaching out and i am uh it's just my pleasure to be here and uh thank you for the coverage we really appreciate it you have a good day yep absolutely that's head coach taylor reynolds of the lancaster flying arrows cross country team we'll have more in the high school sports roundup after this on youtube and soundcloud check out subs.com subs is southwest wisconsin's go-to supplement store find all your favorite supplement brands at the best prices from local people fuel your fitness journey subs.com your go-to supplement store with locations in fenimore and dubuque this week's highlight reel is presented by subs.com Tyler Dictanis with you from the Wolf Construction Broadcast booth here on 97.7 Country WGLR, the Queen Bee Radio Sports YouTube channel. Isabella Sullivan served, dug up in the back row by Layla Thiel. Push up to the front row, tapped over in the net. Great diving dig at the net. And a backwards bump for Brent Plessel sent it over to the southwestern side. Wildcats on the attack. Far side gets it along the sideline. As Aaron Lassie will try to close it out for the Golden Eagles. Golden Eagle fans go to their feet, running jump serve. Just scrapes the top of the net, bumped up by Deal, and it goes backwards. And Barneveld takes set number one, 25-16. Running jump serve, dug up by Plessel in the back. Ball pushed forward, teardropper sent back quickly. And Southwestern back with it on their side. Here's the setup in the middle. And Schneider taps it over, so still kept alive by Barnevelt. Here's the attack. And off the fingertips of Ava Kerwin. Match point for Barnevelt. 24, serving 23. Keely Ormond serving. A serve push to the front row by Thiel. Here's the attack by Kerwin. Great block at the net. 50 50 ball, tap back over. Thiel plays it for Southwestern. Kerwin reloads. Gets it down. Kerwin gets the kill. Tied at 24. Set point and set number three, 26, serving 25. Running jump serve for Kerwin. Plus and controls it in the back row for Barnevelt. Here's a setup in the middle, and a teardropper lands on Barnevelt's side, and Southwestern stays alive. 16, serving 24. Kerwin sends it over, dug up in the back row. Set up on the near side attack. Dug up in the back by Southwestern. Set in the middle, push over on the third hit. Barnabelle built it on their side of the floor. Here's the attack, far side, great block at the net. Popped up and still kept alive by Barnabelle. And a right-handed hit sends it over to the Southwestern side. Wildcats played along the front row. Here's the setup, tapper sent over to Barnabelle. Here's a set, right-handed sent over. 
A set, backwards bump, and a tap over back to Barnevelt. Bump hit, kept alive, and a bump will keep it alive for Southwestern. Barnevelt plays it on their side. Here's the set in the middle. Here's the attack. They're going to dump for the kill. Aaron Lassie gets the kill. And the Barnabelt Golden Eagles will advance to the sectional final on Saturday night. They take down the Southwestern Wildcats three sets to one, 25-16, 25-11, 25-27, and 25-16. Oh, Bloomington Meets 2 LLC on Facebook to see their specials. They want to meet your needs at Bloomington Meets 2. And a pass over the middle on second down. Pass is... Oh, but was he inbound? That is a catch for Northwood Building touchdown. Almost half the quarter already gone. Six and a half minutes to play in the third. It's Fishing lines up under center. And they give inside to Frederick. Is he in? Yes, he is. That's a Northwood Building touchdown. Oh, he down here before and put it on the ground. Now under five and a half minutes to play. Fishnick under center gives inside and Robin Frederick is in for the building touchdown. The receivers to each side of the formation this time. Davis dropping back, looks left, gonna fire a rainbow pass. Looking for the corner and it is... They're gonna say that's caught. And that is a Northland Buildings touchdown. I think that was Ty Adrian, number 12. My goodness, what a catch by Ty Adrian. It's 24 serving 20, set point. The Barnabelle crowd comes to its feet. Daisy Hanson serves. It's a liner dug up in the back row. Here's a setup in the middle, and the attack dug up by Hanson. Set up, attack on the near side. Hits the sideline, and Barnabelle takes set number one. Vanessa Schmitz gets the kill, and it's 25-20. Barnevelt taking set number one from Fall River. Action picks up, set point for Fall River. And a deep spot will send it over. Skirts the top of the net, great diving dig by Barnevelt. Pushes it over to the Fall River side. Here's the attack at the net, and slamming it down for the kill. It's Jenna Vermillion. Jennifer Million with all the smoke behind that one gets the kill. And we are tied at one set apiece. 20. Action resumes. Both teams with one timeout if they need it. In set number three, Isabella Sullivan set to serve for Barnevelt. 23 serving 24. Service dug up in the back row by Kegler. Here's a set on the far side. Attack by Dietzbach. Great block at the net. Sent over on a set. Daisy Hanson keeps it alive. Here's the attack. No, double hit. Ball against Barnevelt. And Fall River takes set. Number three, 25, 23. Hannah Dietzbach set to serve. Running jump serve. Popped up by Hanson. A bump, and Hanson will bump it over for the third hit. Over bumps it up to the front row. They go on the attack. Revealing loads up. Plessel pops it up. Goes out of bounds. And Fall River defeats Barnabelt and will go to state. And Alexis Rundy back court middle. Line across. Forward up midcourt left. Forward set front left. Four across. Dug forward by Olsen. A bump set, front left, Bosberg across, and a side bump by Davis gets the return, dug out by Olsen, back set, McKinley for Krause, spike, and the kill for the Cubans. 25-21, it was Dutch Cuban City, takes set number one, 25-21. 21 serving 24, Aquinas with no margin of error here in set two. Cubans trying to go up two sets to nothing. Served by Davis. That's allowed to go deep service there in Cubans. Takes set 125-21 and set 2, 25-21. Cuba City 
looking for a three set sweep in a sectional final. Aquinas will try to have something to say about it coming up around the corner. 24 all, you must win by two if you're new to the situation in volleyball. Miskowski running jump serve for Aquinas. Ball popped forward by Olsen. Forward set, front left. Vosberg to spike in the kill. Ella Vosberg. And now set point, match point again for Cuba City. Laney Rundy is going back to serve. Looking for a three set sweep of Aquinas in this sectional final. And Laney Rundy running jump serve coming up. It'll be an ace! And the Cubans, for the first time since 2012, are headed back to the dance in Green Bay. Twenty-five, twenty-one, twenty-five, twenty-one, twenty-six, twenty-four. The Cubans sweep the Blue Golds, and Cuba City off to the Rest Center in Green Bay. Coming up on Friday morning. Vertical Raise is the premier online donation platform, utilizing email, text messaging, and social media campaigns to exponentially increase the reach of your fundraiser. With detailed tracking and the complete personalization of every page, Vertical Raise provides an easy system that works. Our experienced representatives have made us the most effective fundraising platform available. We look forward to the opportunity in helping elevate your program to the next level and reaching your goals. Visit online or call today. Back on the Queen Bee Radio High School Sports Roundup, presented by Vertical Rays Milwaukee. It's now time to talk playoff football with our Queen Bee Radio Sports Broadcasters. I'm now joined by Josh Wiederholt, Wally Troughton, and Mark Evenstad. The four of us have the two football games that we'll have on Queen Bee Radio coming up on Friday night. A big matchup in Division Six: Lancaster at Darlington. We'll have that one on 97.7 Country WGLR. And then in Division Seven, Potosi Cassville hosting Blackhawk Warren. Two very fun matchups uh, coming up on Friday night. But let's talk about what we saw first. Uh, in the level two playoff, there are some sad Platteville truthers among us. One of them not uh, on this uh, show because he is currently working and uh, calling Galena Pirates volleyball. So um, unfortunately, our token Platteville truther, Steve Prestigard, won't be able to give his insights. But Josh Wiederholt, you were there uh, for the matchup against Lakeside Lutheran in level two. Lakeside Lutheran coming away with a 28 to seven win uh, over the Hillman. Um, and one of the things that stood out to me as far as uh, your uh, kind of insight on it, Josh, was uh, Lakeside Lutheran's offensive line is big and they ran <laughs> the ball a lot uh, behind it. Uh, talk a little bit about uh, what you saw from uh, that Lakeside Lutheran win over the home in last Friday night. And you're absolutely right. And not just their offensive line being big. Uh, they were at about 6'5", 275 across their tight end. Also 6'5", 265. <laughs> Their quarterback, who threw the ball three times all night, 6'4", like 180. And, yeah, they, they had a game plan against our Hillman, and they executed it. Um, we've covered the Hillman all season long, and they're dangerous. We've seen it when they have the ball. And Lakeside Lutheran realized that. They ran the ball 57 times for 378 yards in the game, and Pretty, uh, just just a ball control game. The two times they did pass, Myron Ryder had a great game defending um, two interceptions off of three passing attempts from Lakeside Lutheran. And really hard game for Platteville to get in and going. Uh, they scored on an early drive to Lucas Ludlam, ended up with four catches for 66 yards and a touchdown. TJ Pink, all intents and purposes, had a good game, 13 of 24, 151 yards in that touchdown. It's just... We're used to seeing them throw the ball 35, 40 times a game, not 24. And yeah, Lakeside Lutheran just executed really well. And Coach Arneson, I mean, nothing to nothing. These guys and Coach Arneson, nothing to really hang your head about. Great season. Weren't who would have expected to be playing a level two home playoff game at the awesome new facilities and great job all together by the Hillman, outright conference champs. I mean just didn't fall their way last Friday night. 
Yep, and Wally, you, you were one of those people at the very beginning of the season saying, you know, look out for Platteville. They're not one of those teams that were going to be finishing in the middle of the pack. Uh, as originally thought, you know, a very successful season uh, for this program. Uh, when you kind of, you know, remember this 2023 team, what are the things that uh, that stand out and, you know, just the historical context of how great this team actually was? It's so much that, yeah, so many questions are all tied together in there. Uh, the big thing, I think, right away, when you look at this Platteville team, the only thing they had trouble with all year long was a big line against them. It's the only place they had trouble. You know, you, you look back at Jefferson, they had the one really big lineman and a good running back that would, and they would, they would end up and they would go on balance line with all their big guys together to try to make use of that, their size. And fortunately, Platteville was, had enough speed and, and, and they could counter it in, in just a small amount. But again, look what happened against Lancaster. If Lancaster could have dominated the line of scrimmage the whole game and just ran the ball and just kind of kept plugging away, they would have won the game. But see, they could they didn't do that. They ended up and they did other things, and Platteville was able to get stops, enough stops, that they could go back and put points on the board right with them. And that's the thing that really bothered them more than anything. And again, you, you look at here, here's a big team, big offensive line. What did they do? They dominated up front and won the game. And that's where Plateau had the biggest problem. It isn't that the skill of the guys that are up front for Plateau. The skill is fine. Mm, I mean, definitely. they're making the right moves. They're going the right places. They're doing the right things. But let's face it. If you're 195, 210 pounds and you're going against 260 and 270, you don't have a chance. You really don't. Um, I think it's tremendous that they were able to do enough, a good job up front, blocking on pass plays to be able to throw the ball as well as they did. Um, unfortunately, you can't get your, your speedy running back going under those kinds of circumstances. You need to be able to have a line opening up at least something so that he can pop through. And and I, I would say it sounds like that wasn't going to happen against that team. Yep. And we when we I saw that as a general, you know, to kind of exp the other thing and, and about Platform coming kind of almost from nowhere in a lot of people's minds. Why? A lot of it has to do with the attitude of the kids and Butch Arneson. I mean, I, I think a lot of him. I mean, I told well, again in one of the interviews that, and Steve would tell you this. Um, I kind of told him, I said, "I'm going to, Grace, I'm going to put the monkey on your back." Back in the '50s, Platteville went through a period of time after Coach Hill re retired that they went through a series of coaches and did not do well. Vern Bradenberg showed up on the scene. His first year, he did okay. Second year, he did really well, and on they were off to the races after that all the way up until oh right around the year 2000 you know that we're talking over 50 over 50 years of football there that all of a sudden platteville was the team to beat period we can say everything we want about everyone else but they were the team to beat yep and kind of went into those doldrums again and now brace is here and we can see that excitement it's an excitement amongst the school it's excitement amongst the parents it's excitement amongst the kids. That's what you have to have if you want a winning program. And I think he's got it. It's there. It's just a matter of it continuing. And I think he can pull it off. I definitely agree, especially talking with Coach Arneson a couple times. And you're absolutely right about their offensive line up front. I mean, TJ Pink, not just fr last Friday, he had all day to pass and yeah, they just didn't possess the ball enough and kind of got bit by the injury bug in the season two, missing uh, Garrish and Tashner and Zach McLean. That hurt. Um, losing uh, Riley Donahoe, Coffey, Baxter, Millard, and Key. Those are very big contributors, but they're going to have a lot returning. And now we're going to have to see what they do next year when they will have big expectations. I think one of the things that if the kids, and I do think the kids see this, but they get themselves in the weight room. They build themselves up. They get stronger. Um, 
strength, I think, will make a difference. But again, remember, Platteville's a lot younger than people think they are. Mm-hmm. A lot of people thought, oh, this is a this team, they're about an average, you know, but about as many seniors and juniors and all that. No, they don't have many seniors. It's mostly juniors and a few sophomores. That's really what they are. And as long as they can continue to build on what they've got, I think they're going to be tougher than nails next year. Yeah, this is a very deep team that Platteville uh, had this year. And by my count, nine seniors that are graduating from this team. Granted, a few of them are at the skill positions. But again, you know, when you're playing or rotating in six wide receivers, I mean, you can afford to, you know, potentially, you know, lose a couple and and still have that foundation to uh, build off of. And uh, like we said, Platteville seems to uh, be on the right track. Coach Arneson, by the way, coach of the year uh, in the uh, SWC and very much uh, deserved with the outright conference championship that uh, Platteville won. So that's the Platteville Hillman's season in 2023. Uh, let's touch on Division 5 briefly for just a moment. The last local team in the field was Prairie du Chien. They fell to Columbus 33-8. to um, pretty much a dominant uh, performance by uh, Columbus in the matchup. And as uh, you know, I've kind of alluded to uh, over the last couple of weeks, once the brackets first came out, uh, Columbus being a three seed uh, as a the reigning defending uh, Division Four state champion, they were playing with a chip on their shoulder. They certainly uh, played like it against Prairie du Chien, having to go to Prairie du Chien to uh, get that win. So uh, Prairie du Chien's uh, season uh, comes to an end. And now we'll move into Division 6. We have been hoping that this matchup would happen down the line, and we finally get it in Level 3, Lancaster at Darlington. Uh, Shark, you were there for the, we'll call it upset win just because of the seeding. It was uh, Lancaster, the 3 seed, going to Kenosha, knocking off the 2 seed, uh, 30 to 20. And just looking at the... Uh, stats, it seemed like it was death taxes and give Peyton Alvar out of the football. 36 attempts for 230 yards and four touchdowns. Um, I'm sure the stats are very indicative of uh, how the game actually went. But from your vantage point, what really stood out in the win uh, for the Flying Arrows against Kenosha setting up this matchup against Darlington? Well, I think the first thing, uh, Tyler, was uh, the fact that they scored. They got the first score of the game. And hey, you know, um, you know, <laughs> how often do you see that some some team gets the first score of the game, but that's all they get because the other team, you know, wised up to a few things and shut them out the rest of the way. But in this case, it was Lancaster taking the six nothing lead, and then second quarter getting another touchdown and taking a twelve nothing lead uh, before halftime. That was huge. Uh, that that just put the arrows up in a situation where hey. They could tell themselves, hey, we can do this. We can take a lead on this team, and hopefully we can maintain that lead. Well, um, you had St. Joe scoring uh, shortly before halftime, making it 12-7. to And uh, then a last drive right before the half. Here you had St. Joe's down in the what we call the green zone, brought to you by Bitech Resource Management. Um, I was saying all along, gosh, if they can get a hold here, it would, it would just – do tons of good for Lancaster and their confidence. And sure enough, they held. They had a goal line stand, and they went into the locker room uh, with the uh, with the lead at uh, 12 to 7. But then the uh, second half started, and the third play of the second half, then uh, what you had was uh, St. Joe's getting a touchdown. Gordon, their outstanding, outstanding running back, he uh, he scored on a long touchdown run, and they went up 14 to 12. And I said that at the time. All right, here we go. Here we go. St. Joe's is going to just uh, uh, dominate from this point on. But that wasn't the case. Lancaster got the next score, and that was huge, retaking the lead. So here they got punched in the mouth, and what they did is they punched right back. And they never lost that lead the rest of the game. That was that was just so big. And, yes, Alvarado had just an outstanding game running the football. And uh, there was a couple of key uh, receptions, one by um, – by Taylor Williams that picked up a first down. And I believe there was Alvarado who picked up a big first down uh, after a third and long. 
Another thing was, was that Lancaster had a very, what looked like to be a promising drive in the second half, but it looked like it was being derailed. There was two big penalties. One wiped out a big gain, and then a couple of plays later, it wiped out a touchdown. And you're thinking to yourself, oh no, this is not Lancaster's night now. But Lancaster kept the drive alive, converted those uh, uh, second and longs and third and longs, and kept the drive alive and scored a touchdown. So despite those two penalties that would have crushed another team, Lancaster was able to come back and uh, maintain the lead. Yeah, the big win for Lancaster avenging the loss that they had in level two last year at uh, Kenosha St. Joseph. And and we kind of talked about this uh, last week, Shark, where, you know, having that having that game last year probably helpful as far as you know schematically what kenosha you know wants to do and kenosha st joseph been you know a very successful team only you know maybe a handful of losses you know over the last uh, couple of seasons and and lancaster going on the road getting a, a very impressive win and now they take on darlington who just escaped mineral point a seven nothing final the only touchdown uh in the game came in the third quarter it was a one-yard touchdown run for uh, Braden or Bray, Braylon Goble. Um, and, you know, just looking at the uh, individual stats for uh, both teams, the only 100 yard rusher was Ty Christ on 30 carries, um, and he didn't uh, see the end zone. Uh, Gibson Spurley of Mineral Point really held in check eight completions for 21 yards, 76 total yards, and two interceptions uh, on his stat line. I anticipated that this game was going to be very close i was not expecting a defensive rock fight between uh these two teams and i think if you're the lancaster flying arrow shark you gotta have a lot of confidence going into that game because you knew you know granted lancaster saw mineral points at the very beginning of the season before mineral point went on you know this this run but you know going on the road taking down you know kenosha a good response game for lancaster after uh struggling against cambridge in level one now you go on the road again against uh, one of the premier teams in Southwest Wisconsin, if not the premier team uh, in in our area. I think there's a there's a lot to like for the Flying Arrows heading into this matchup, Shark. Well, yeah, because uh, they've shown the ability to run the football with uh, Peyton Alvarado, and he just gets the bulk of the carries, and he just keeps plowing through the line time and time again and squirting out and picking up big yardage. But uh, not only that, but they have the ability to pass the football. And you look at the uh, stats that uh, Nolan Wolf has had this year, you, you had a good feeling with Kenosha St. Joe's because their quarterback, Kennedy, is pretty good, but he doesn't throw the ball a whole lot. And he uh, had um, 10 touchdowns and only one interception going into that game last week. Well, Nolan Wolf has 15 passing touchdowns and only two interceptions on the season. So you kind of think that the, those two matched up. So, Will Nolan Wolf be able to put up really good numbers again against Darlington? Well, that remains to be seen because of Darlington's defense, and they're certainly known for that. But uh, th these two teams are very comparable with each other. Like, for instance, uh, Lancaster, um, passing-wise, they're passing for 109.9 yards per game and rushing for 268 yards per game. Darlington, meanwhile, passing... They pass for 118 yards per game, and they are running the football at 285 yards per game. So they're very comparable. These are almost mirror images of the two teams when it comes to offense and defense. Yep, absolutely. And and just a noteworthy uh, tidbit about this uh, game, too, is that uh, going back to 1989, when these two teams have gone head to head, they've met 16 times. It is dead tied eight to eight you know between these two it, it is going to be an awesome awesome game we're going to have that one on 97.7 country wglr and technology pending on the queen bee radio sports youtube channel we're hoping that we can get that on our yep. youtube stream as well go ahead wally one thing that i think about it and people tend to do this you tend to look at you know, who you've played, common opponents, you know, that type of a thing, and how did it go against them, and on and on and on. I learned a long time ago, you can't take any stock in that. I don't care who they played, what the score was, or anything. It's about how these two teams will match up with each other. 
Mm -hmm. The big advantage Lancaster has, offensive line. That's their advantage. And what can Darlington do to neg uh, negate that? That's going to be the real challenge in this ballgame. Um, Darlington's pretty darn resourceful, and I, they know that. They know what's up front. It's just a matter of them finding out how to deal with that. And if they can negate that, it's it looks good for Darlington if they can. I don't know if they can, but that's why they play the game. And they're, they're Darlington all year in the games that I've caught. They're just they're not quite as big size wise as they have been traditionally. But man, those Chris guys up front and they're 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 a strong, well disciplined football team, ever giving up seven points a game average which is just kind of crazy and kind of uh going back to the history like you were talking about tyler i mean it's just it's crazy because we've grown up you know we've had darlington and lancaster in the area or Dar but statewide these are two of the top 10 teams historically in the entire state and i mean i the storyline that i'm kind of excited about now it's coach rollin and coach winker's time and now it's mm -hmm. time for them them to, you know, go to state. So, yeah, it's going to be a really, really fun matchup. Um, going to be kind of a, a high-scoring offense against a great defense. And, yeah, makes for great games. You guys are going to – you guys are lucky you get to do this game. That's going to be a lot of yeah. fun for you guys. Looking forward as to well it. As well as everyone there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And Definitely going to be a fun one. And this will be the first time ever – that Darlington is facing Lancaster uh, in a playoff game under the lights. Right. Yeah. Yeah. For many, very, many years, very fun matchup. Yeah. Absolutely. For many, many years, Darlington did not have lights. They installed the lights here about, uh, oh, about eight, nine years ago. Um, there was a game between Lancaster and Darlington. I think it was three years ago that was played with Lancaster winning um, thanks to a block punt and several other factors. That was under the lights, but uh, yeah, this will, overall is only the second meeting between these two teams with the all new lights that were installed at Darlington back in, I think it was 2013 or 14. Mm -hmm. Going to be rocking. And pound for pound, one of the best concession stands in the area too for <laughs> high school football games. Is well, forget that. And, <laughs> and I'll say it's really a good concession stand right after Cuba cities, which is still <laughs> number one. <laughs> Yep. So again, we will have uh, Darlington and Lancaster coming up Friday night on 97.7 Country WGLR pending technology on the Queen Bee Radio Sports YouTube channel. Let's talk about the matchup that we have in Division 7. Potosi Cassville hosting Six Rivers rival Blackhawk Warren. Wally and I will have the call of that one on Super Hits 106 and on the Queen Bee Radio Sports YouTube channel. Uh, I got to call the game last week between River Ridge and Potosi Cassville, another Six Rivers uh, rematch. And boy, did Roman Frederick make his presence felt in that matchup and on the night. 36 carries, 219 yards, and two touchdowns. Uh, Braden Fishnick only had to throw the ball twice. One of his, his only completion went to Eli Adams for a 15-yard touchdown pass. The big thing for River Ridge in the matchup was that Andrew Nice, he had that uh, leg injury to end the game against Highland in level one. He was a game time decision. And when I mean game time decision, I mean, we found out at kickoff whether or not he was going to play. Uh, he, he was suited up. He was warming up. Um, but uh, unfortunately, um, uh, Andrew Nice was not uh, well enough to uh, go in that one. Brock Bungie uh, did have a pretty solid outing um, in that fullback position, 15 carries for 90 yards uh, for the uh, Timberwolves. But I think where uh, they really missed, uh, Andrew Nice was on the defensive side of the ball because uh, Potosi Castle was just able to uh, control the game, uh, ground and pound. Um, it was, you know, it got to a three score game uh, into the uh, third quarter or Early part of the fourth quarter, River Ridge did have a touchdown pass uh, in the fourth with about 3.57 to go. It was a, a Davis to Ty Adrian uh, touchdown pass, the two-point conversion unsuccessful. Also, if you were watching along on our YouTube stream, 
um, Brady Bungie of uh, River Ridge uh, had a very scary injury uh, with about three minutes to go in that game. Um, uh, the ambulance had to come out of the field. There was about a 20, 25 minute delay. Um, and, you know, fortunately, from what we heard uh, that evening, uh, Brady's going to be OK. Um, it was a, a neck injury. He did have a feeling uh, in his uh, limbs, uh, but obviously, you know, a very, very scary and frightening sight uh, that kind of put a damper on um, what was supposed to be a very um, celebratory night for uh, Potosi Cassville. But, um, you know, that kind of put a hamper on the uh, results of the game. Uh, but Potosi Castle does advance to level three and they get uh, Blackhawk Warren, who defeated Johnson Creek, um, had to go to Johnson Creek to uh, get the win in that matchup. As I had the stats up here, but now I don't. Where did they go? But Blackhawk was uh, just absolutely dominant uh, in the matchup. Um, scored 32 points in the second quarter alone <laughs> against uh, uh, Johnson Creek. Uh, looking at the uh, individual stats, um, Lane Marty with 120 yards rushing, two touchdowns. Owen Seferud, 118 yards and a touchdown. Um, Eli Schlem, four of eight passing, 77 yards and one touchdown. Um, we talked about how well these... Uh, Southwest Wisconsin teams, particularly in the Six Rivers and Division Seven, um, those that style of football travels well, and it certainly did. Uh, heading across the state against uh, Johnson Creek to uh, get the win, and it sets up a rematch between uh, Potosi Cassville and Blackhawk Warren. Potosi Cassville winning the uh, regular season matchup, forty-one to twenty. Uh, Shark, you were on the call of uh, that first matchup. When you uh, kind of look back on uh, what happened in that first matchup, from what I remember, it was, you know, that first half, Potosi Caswell really set the tone. And then it was, you know, kind of uh, even keel, you know, most of the second half. But uh, when you uh, when you look back on what happened in that first matchup, what kind of stood out to you as far as things that Potosi Castle did right? And what does Blackhawk Warren have to uh, get themselves ready for in this level three matchup? Yeah, well, what I saw was that the Potosi Cassville really, uh, they really established the running game in that game early, often in the in the uh, first half of the game. They just they just found holes. Uh, they weren't really big holes, but they ran through those holes quite well and uh, seized the game in the first half and then went on to the win. And yeah, it was more even keel in the uh, second half, uh, so much so that uh, with the lead that they had, they did bring in uh, Frederick. Uh, for just a few plays late in the game, just so that I guess he could get used to getting hit, you know, because I guess uh, he did play significantly more the following week. But yeah, the running game ruled for Potosi Castle in that win over uh, Blackhawk Warren on a very nice Saturday afternoon last month. Yep, absolutely. And and we should also note in that game, it was uh, Eli Adams, the other feature back for Potosi Castle, got injured late in that game. He missed the matchup the following week in the game that Josh and I got the call between uh, Potosi Castle and River Ridge, which was an instant classic uh, uh, matchup that, that we got to see in that one. Um, Josh, you know, when, when you and I got to see Potosi Castle, I mean – it was different as far as what Potosi Castle probably wanted to do offensively, you know, just having to rely on uh, Logan Rausch and Joe Haas to uh, kind of be the ball carriers and kind of help, you know, run this offense. But, you know, give shout outs to uh, uh, Braden Fishnick, who helped uh, Potosi Castle dig out that win against uh, River Ridge and keep uh, their outright conference championship Um in place but um for now it it seems like now that the full complement of backs are are ready to go for potosi gasville uh it's i i don't know if this is you know probably an appropriate term but it's not pick your poison it's choose how you want to die you know <laughs> which running back do you want to uh have run it down your throat and uh once uh once roman frederick got going against river ridge i mean it was it, it's a completely different dynamic as far as uh, what Potosi Castle uh, wants to do. And I think that that's a very welcome sight, especially where they're at in this point in the season to have someone as dependable and reliable as Roman Frederick back in the mix. Definitely. You know, I want yep. to kind of go, go along with that. I, I, I'm looking back at the, the stats of that game. And as you look at the stats, there isn't any doubt who won the game. I mean, 
they dominated in every aspect of it. When it came to first downs, way ahead. When it came to passing yards, they were ahead, although neither one wanted to throw the ball. Um, running the football, it was all Potosi. Uh, defensively, it was again, a wide, all the way across the line, it was different people making all the taxes. So no one had a lot. It was everyone contributing. Or if you look at Black Hawk Warren, you've got about three or four guys in there that had multiple, you know, up into close to being involved in 10 tackles. You didn't see that on the Potosi side, which again is saying you got everyone involved. Um, Black Hawk Warren's going to have their hands full again. I think I, I just look at it that way. I'm not going to say they can't do it because they're a very fine football team and they're very physical. But again, you mentioned that one name, Frederick. I mean, he's good. <laughs> he's really good. Mm -hmm. And you've got a few other guys in there that aren't too shabby. But you know what? If you're running the ball like that, you got them up front. And the guys up front are doing the job. And you have to compliment them as well. And I go back to the something I talk about everyone quite often, and that's the coaching staff. You know, you're sitting there, and I, I, I look at Potosi. I don't care who calls the plays for him. All I know, except we know it's Mark. They just seem to call the right plays at the right time for the right situation. They just seem to be doing it on a regular basis. Um, I don't know. I, I, my, my choice, if I had to pick a winner, I would be picking, picking Potosi Castle. But at the same token, Black Hawk Warren has run that Bear offense really well for a long time. And I don't care who's been sitting in the uh, coach's chair. It's been going on for a long time, and they've been very successful all the way through. Yep, Josh, go ahead. Uh, I mean, <laughs> when Potosi Castle, that beating a really, really good River Ridge team in that first matchup when they had Adams and Frederick out, if that's not a statement win, I don't know what is. I mean, because <laughs> that game proved uh, Fishnick can run the ball, but now having Adams and Frederick back and able being able to pull out that win without those guys, man, that they're getting healthy at the right time, and that's what you need in the playoffs. Yeah, you know, since I'm calling the game, I'm not gonna gonna pick a winner. But the thing that I'm gonna look for heading into this one is how fast does Potosi Castle start? Because if Potosi Castle jumps out to a big lead. As good as that offense is for Blackhawk Warren, uh, Steve Prestigard mentioned this, you know, a couple different times during during our show that it's not really an offense that's conducive to getting you back into games. If you're if you're down behind, if you need points, you know, if you don't have a you know sustained passing attack, you can't really uh, do that much. Whereas Potosi Castle, we know that they have a number of uh, different options that they can go to. Um, you know, outside of the two uh, running backs that have uh, carried the workload. So, um, so yeah, I'm, I'm very curious to see how quickly Potosi Castle jumps out to the lead. And, and you know, Shark, you saw that firsthand. I mean, Potosi Castle jumped out to a big lead to begin the game, and, and they were able to uh, maintain it. It's in uh, Potosi Castle's uh, home field. Uh, looking forward to seeing how uh, that one shakes out on Friday night again. Well, I will have the call of that one on Friday night on Super Hits 106 and on the Queen Bee Radio Sports YouTube channel. So, uh, guys, I'll kind of go uh, one by one. I'll start off with you, Josh. Um, you know, these four teams that are left, I, I mean, these are kind of the blue blood team, so to speak, as far as uh, high school <laughs> yeah. football uh, in our area. And the really exciting part for us is that we will have level four playoff action next week as well. We're going to follow the winners of these uh, game. So, you know, we're very spoiled and being able to do that. But, um, you know, knowing the two matchups that we have, the four teams th that are remaining, um, what kind of stands out to you as we head into uh, this uh, level three playoff weekend? Uh, and you you hit the nail on the head. I mean, these are kind of their they're legacy teams, which is <laughs> awesome. And um, I I think a really awesome storyline, especially in the game that Shark and I are covering, is uh, Coach Rowland and Coach Winkers are both. This is a legacy 
I mean, they've already had good success, but this is like this is one of those wins that, and it's cliche, but you talk about it twenty years from now, and mm -hmm. I that's just awesome and a really good matchup in the game you guys are covering. And it's just kind of we saw it coming all season long with just the quality of play of the teams in this area. And now it's finally coming to a head and it's very, very exciting. Yep, Shark, what, what's the thing that you're looking forward to the most with this uh, level three action that we have coming up? Well, kind of what uh, Josh was saying about legacy, you've got Lancaster who's won seven state titles and a couple of runner up finishes. And you have Darlington that has four state titles and something like seven runner-up finishes themselves. Um, and the programs are you know, pretty much equal. Not so much equal in their style of play, but the fact that uh, they predominantly run the football and they're very successful in, in doing so. Uh, maybe a slight edge for Darlington in this game, so, and only simply because it's a home game for them. But you take a look at uh, Lancaster, just one loss this year, and that was by one point and by three inches. The game against Platteville. Darlington, their only loss this year to Prairie du Chien by two points. And with, with Darlington rallying in the fourth quarter and missing out on a two-point extra point that could have tied that game. So, yeah, the two teams are pretty much even in that department. Um, we'll see how well they run the football as far as passing the football. They're both having success doing it. Lancaster's not known as a passing team, but, boy, this year um, they're getting it done. And Darlington, not known as a passing team, but they too, simply getting it done. But look for the run, the, the running attack of each team, what they do. Can Darlington stop Peyton Alvarado? Hard to say. Nobody stopped them so far this year. And uh, Lancaster, they get, or, uh, Lancaster's defense, who are they going to want to stop? Because Darlington seems to have a really good stable of running backs on their side of the ball. Yeah, you hit a point that's very interesting, Shark, in that – both teams are two point conversion away from being undefeated. You, you know, th yeah. th that's a really hard, hard thing to, you know, kind of think about. And then, you know, how different does the playoff picture, how different does the conference picture, it, you know, look drastically. And we, when we say it's a game of inches, we truly mean it is a game of inches. Yep. And, and, you know, like you guys said, th this matchup, the, the legacy matchup between these teams, it's, it's kind of like, you know, a, a Duke and a Kentucky meeting in the NCAA tournament in the final four. Like it's, it's that, you know, type of quality matchup Two very strong uh, football programs. Their fan bases are, you know, devoted and die hard. And it's, it's going to be uh, electric for you guys on, on Friday night at Martins field. And uh, Wally, the thing you're looking forward to most in uh, level three coming up on Friday night. You know, the, the thing I guess I look at first is just the idea of the four teams that are at this level in this from this area right now. They're teams that are used to being there. They're used to being at this level. This is this is like a normal season for them. Um, granted, Potosi doesn't carry the state championships and a lot of the and the state runner ups like Blackhawk Warren does or like the other two teams that are playing in our area. But this is so typical of this corner of Wisconsin. Um, what is it? I think was it just which year was it that we didn't have somebody playing in Camp Randall like one year out of the last 15? Mm -hmm. Think about that. That tells you a little bit about what brand of football is played in Southwest Wisconsin. We've looked at it and I think we've all commented when it comes to physical play, top to bottom, the Southwest Wisconsin teams are the most physical that you'll find just about anywhere. I don't care, you can, yeah, so you got the, some places where, you know, the top three teams in the league are really great and then they're real physical and all that. But you take a look at the Six Rivers, it's top to bottom. In this mm -hmm. SWAL, it's top to bottom for the most part. There's one exception there. And the same thing when you take a look at the SWC, top to bottom. They're all very physical teams, and they're all talented, and they're all well coached. The game that we're looking at Friday night, and I'm looking forward to this because 
this is a matter of seeing the old offense that I've kind of I've kind of always liked. The idea of you blend a wing T and a spread offense together and you get Potosi. And then you're going against the old style where they line up and they run the good old split veer type offense. And it's you know what they're going to do. They got those backs up so close to the line, they're almost their their helmets are almost hitting the backs of the of the linemen. And they hit the hole quick that way. And that helps them in that veer offense. But again, everything, I don't care which one of these two games we're talking about, these games are all up to the guys up front. I don't care. I don't care if they're Alvarado's on this team or not. If he didn't have those guys in front of him, he wouldn't be jacking up the yards like he's jacking up. And if you take a look at what's happening down in Darlington, if they didn't have that strong offensive line, you wouldn't be seeing this record that they've put together. And that same thing is true with Blackhawk Warren and with Potosi. It's the guys up front that are making this. They're the names that nobody knows. But you know what? We're going to make certain we mention their names at the ball games because they're, we're going to see some serious work up front. And I'm excited. I, I This is one of these things that, Tyler, I think you agree with me. We're got, we've got a great game that we get to do Friday night, but we'd take the other game too. We'd switch. Mm -hmm. Because yeah. these are all going to be great games. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's going to be fun. I really do, from our point of view. Um, and what else is, whoever does not come out on top, hold your head high. Because you've yeah. earned yourself a lot. And you've earned yourself a more praise than we can ever give you. It's going to be fun. Yeah, and, and I think for me, I think it's just, the emotion that's attached to these two games. I mean, the, the fact that half of these teams will not be playing football next week after such a successful season. And, and you know, we talked about, you know, the uh, season that, that Platteville had. Um, I, I think Blackhawk Warren has kind of been that, that dark horse team in the Six Rivers. Like, you know, are they going to reload? And, you know, hey, guess what? They're back in level three, just like they've always been. And, you know, Potosi Castle, oh, yeah, we're we're going to, you know, win the conference third year in a row. Of course, we're, we're going to, um, you know, Darlington, you know, yes, we're the top team in the swall. We, you know, that's kind of been been the constant. I, I think the the overall thing that I'm looking at is which team breaks tendency or puts a little gambles a little bit to try and get the win. Uh, what will a team do something that they're not normally accustomed to doing to, you know, kind of get a slight edge, um, you know, on, on their opponent. Um, I think that might be something that we see in the matchup that Wally and I have in division seven with Potosi Castle and Blackhawk Warren, because they've seen each other once already. Um, but uh, you know, with uh, Lancaster and Darlington didn't see each other yet this season, the uh, you know, common opponent, is Platteville and you know we saw you know Platteville just one bad half against Darlington from being you know undefeated Lancaster that two point conversion against Platteville that was their uh you know opportunity to uh, uh be undefeated so it's I, I'm curious to see which team breaks a tendency or does something to lay it on the line so to speak to uh, do what they have to do to uh, uh, get the win, and I'm very, very excited. I'm, I'm, I'm just, I'm a bit jealous at the fact that uh, both games have to happen at the same time. That we don't yes. have the uh, option to do a double header, and and you know, why did why did Darlington have to install the lights? You know, ten years ago, <laughs> why couldn't they play it during the <laughs> afternoon? You know, keep with tradition, and then we have this nightcap of a a rock fight in in the in the Six Rivers. But go ahead, Shark. Tyler, take that up with Wadsey Martins. <laughs> well, of course, he's gone now. But a great quote from Wazi was that if God intended for football to be played under the lights, he'd make a bigger moon. <laughs> <laughs> I remember hearing that quote before. And I'll certainly be watching the uh, replay of your guys' stream once I get home from <laughs> Shark and I's game. I mean, just great night for football. And uh, shout out to uh, Lee Black as well. Um, the field mm -hmm. looked great today. We, we were looking to set up the stream. And mm -hmm. yeah, Darlington, it's beautiful, beautiful and great atmosphere. And yeah, I'm I'm not, I'm actually going to watch your guys' stream Friday night <laughs> once I get home. 
that's, yeah, it's, I think I think we all agree that one of the things that's going to be the hardest is the fact we actually have to broadcast the game and not just watch the game. Right. Yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah. 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 And don't forget too, guys, that uh, uh, Tyler was talking about was Platteville a common denominator with Lancaster and Darlington, but Darlington's uh, other uh, common denominator with their opponent this week is Mineral Point. And yep. mm -hmm. Lancaster won the game against Mineral Point to open up the season. Again, that was um, 12 to 7, low scoring yep. game. And against Darlington, two low scoring games, 20 to 14 in last week's 7 to nothing. Oh, yeah. High school, high school football this year. I, 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 and granted, I've, I've only been, you know, covering high school football for, you know, a handful of seasons, um, you know, since I started, you know, doing the, the radio stuff, but man, this year was just something, something special. And I'm, I'm very, very excited to see what happens um, after uh, these games are done on, on Friday night, which teams advance uh, and, and what teams uh, we get to follow, you know, the winners of this game, one game away from state. And it's it's, you know, going to put everything, you know, on the line to uh, earn that spot uh, into Camp Randall. I'll turn it over to you, to you Wally. Uh, final thought. You know, you, when you're talking in terms of those kinds of things about the, all of a sudden you, you kind of like you all of a sudden found high school football again. You know, if, when you finally got back into broadcasting a little bit. But, you know, when you think about it and you particularly look at Southwest Wisconsin and a few other places where you don't have the big schools and have all the recruiting going on in the private schools and all that, this is where you see pure football. It's pure. And this is where the, it's all about kids, good coaching, and really an atmosphere that's brought forth. And it's, um, I think it makes it more exciting to me, I would much rather watch one of these high school football games in Southwest Wisconsin, not just necessarily these two games, but a lot of the teams in this area, than to sit Sunday afternoon in front of the TV and watch some guys who get paid a lot of money to play. I'd rather watch this. Mm -hmm. Just the same as I'd rather be at the Division Three College Stadium on Saturday afternoon than to be in a big Big Ten Stadium or any other major college, because again, it's more, more pure than what we see in all of this other stuff. Uh, I'm excited for these kids to have this opportunity to do this. And, you know, if you've ever been involved with a, a program when you were in school that had success like this, you, you look back and you say, I'm glad these kids are having this chance too. You know, because I couldn't play in high school because I wasn't any good. But I turned around and we had really fantastic teams. And I yep. saw what that did to the school, what that did to all of these guys, and how it how it helped them. And I look at seeing that's what we're seeing in southwest Wisconsin as a general rule with our kids in this area that are playing. And I'll tell you, for anyone who may catch a little bit of this that doesn't normally watch high school football, do it this week. And I have a final, as much as you don't think when you're that age, as much as you don't think it'll be true in the future, 20 years later, I can contest, you still remember those games. Oh, yes. I still remember the guy from uh, Spring Valley, Minnesota, that was this outstanding running back that we were really worried about. And fortunately, he didn't score as many points as we did. And then a few years later, I saw him wearing a New York Giants football uniform. And the fact that we shut him down. <laughs> if you could say that happened. And, and again, now God rest his soul, uh, Jerry Uskard, who used to be down in Bloomington mm -hmm. for years. I used to come back up to him and I'd say, Jerry, good to see you. And we'd pat each other in the back and talk stupid things. And I'd say, but remember, his hometown, Mabel, never could beat my hometown, Harmony. <laughs> and these kids will and have And I mean that you, years later, you can still have that kind of a feeling and that, that camaraderie amongst opponents. Mm -hmm. I do have one other thing left to say. We talked about the Bryce Arneson, Coach of the Year for the SWC Conference. Congratulations to him. And congratulations to Jimmy Kuska who's the assistant coach mm -hmm. of the year 
<laughs> in the Rigid Valley Conference. Yes. Yep, saw that saw that earlier today too. Congratulations to our friend Jimmy Cuska, not just co-coach of the year, but the single best media kit put out for any high school football team uh, Hands in, down. in uh, across the state. And uh, and yeah, it, it's and he I loves mean, it. Yeah, and and you know, look. It, you can tell, too, it's not just the kids, but the communities are so invested in these uh, football teams as well. There's a lot of support, um, you know, it, especially these playoff games. I mean, the fans turn out, uh, you know, everyone is is showing out, uh, you know, for these games. And um, it's it's just really great to see. It's, it's unfortunate that the season, you know, does have to come to an end at, at some point, And thus our football coverage will, will have to come to an end. Uh, but uh, but yeah, what a what a fun season it's been. We know that we have at least two more weeks of high school football for our, our local teams here, and uh, it's going to be a thrilling finish uh, to end. And hopefully one, if not two of our local teams uh, can uh, go to Camp Randall and experience the opportunity to uh, compete for a state championship. Thank you, Josh Wiederholt. Thank you, Mark Evenstead. Thank you, Wally Troughton for chatting with, our, with us about our uh, high school football coverage again. On Friday night, uh, Lancaster at Darlington on 97.7 Country WGLR, most likely on the Queen Bee Radio Sports YouTube channel. And then we also have Potosi Castle hosting Blackhawk Warren on Super Hits 106. That will be on the Queen Bee Radio Sports YouTube channel for sure. Thank you, gentlemen, again for uh, taking some time to chat with us. And that is this week's episode of the Queen Bee Radio High School Sports Roundup. We'll see you next week for another edition on Thursday.